I'm happy about it, God's a lot happier. Because you're in his house to worship him. And that's what you're supposed to be on Sunday morning. So welcome here. We'd like to do a few. Let me pray first. Then we'll have a few announcements and then we'll get started. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for blessing our lives and providing this wonderful house for us to come to to worship. You've just blessed us all. Father God, we just ask you to take care of everybody, those that are here, those that are not here. As Christians, our concern should be for the people that are not in your house today. We have concern for each other, but we need to have more concern for the people that are not here. I just look at the 500,000 people that are no longer alive for whatever reason, and I wonder how many of them were lost. We, we need to witness to people while they're here. So help each one of us to be brave and to witness just as good as you can, whatever that is. If all you do is invite somebody to church, that may be it. That may be all you need to do. But just be with us today, be with Ken as he brings us the message and help us all to be attentive and charge our battery, leave here this day ready to, to witness and be good Christians. Help us to be strong and, and do a positive thing in our communities. And all these things I ask in Christ's name. Amen. And we got an announcement. Where I'm is? behind you. Here she is. Good morning. We are excited to announce that April 3rd, which is the Saturday before Easter, just in case I have the date wrong, we are going to resume having an Easter egg hunt. We will um, hunt eggs out back and to the side and be divided up by age groups so the little ones don't get run over by the big ones. But um, birth through fifth grade, we are inviting you to an Easter egg hunt April 3rd. More details to come as we get closer. But adult Sunday school classes, if you could donate a bag of candy, um, I'll have a container out front in the um, welcoming hall next weekend for you to place those in so that we can stuff some eggs for, the, our, our, mm, for our Easter egg hunt. But again, details to come April 3rd. Put it on your calendar and be ready to join us. We're looking forward to it. The men's Bible study, we're going to start back Saturday morning at 7.30. We, uh, just, it's a good chance to build a relationship among men any age. And we do a, a Bible study and we spend about an hour. And it gets you up and gets you going. And then you go home and get all your chores done. Annie Armstrong offering is all during March. Our goal is to raise $2,000. And, and all that money, you know, is to go out help those people out there that we need to be helping because we've already been blessed. We've got a paint party next Saturday, March the 13th, starting at 8 o'clock. Jonathan Hodge is coordinating that, so if you need more info, call Jonathan and ask him what you need to do. Bring a paintbrush or a roller or whatever. Drop a cloth and take part. We'd like to congratulate Trent and Allison Bass on their new son, Walter Luke Bass, born March the 1st. We're going to grow a church one way or another. Then the last thing, contact Johnny Starlin if you can help mow grass. We have the lawnmowers and the gas. You just have to volunteer to come out and ride a while. So most men can, can ride and steer, so help us out. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to the musicians. Good morning, KMBC kids. I have something with me that you may or may not have seen at home or in the glove box of the truck or the car. You see, these are maps. Specifically, they're road maps. People used to use them to figure out how to get from one place to the other. For example, if you ever move to a new town, you might buy a road map or a street map for that town so that you could figure out how to get from home to work or to school or maybe even church. And sometimes going on trips, you would use these road maps to figure out how to get from home to Walt Disney World. And then once you got to Orlando, Florida, you'd get another map to figure out how to get to your hotel. And then once you got to the theme park, 
you'd get another kind of map to figure out where all the rods were. But you see, we don't use maps like this much anymore because most everyone has a phone and on their phone they have a map app or maybe they have a GPS that's not on their phone. But if you put in the address of where you want to go, it will tell you turn by turn how to get where you're going, which has probably saved a lot of arguments because I bet when we used maps, there were lots of arguments with moms and dads because dad would sometimes get lost and maybe he wouldn't stop and ask for directions. Because you see, sometimes using the map, a person that could give you directions because they knew the area you were in was really helpful so that you didn't have to search and search on the map to try to figure out where you were and then search and search some more to try to figure out where you were going. So it's really cool that our phones now have that map app on it. It sort of simplifies the process. <coughs> but I think about going into a bookstore. You know, one of the largest areas in a bookstore is a self-help section. Books about how to make more money, how to be happier in life, how to find love, all sorts of things that are supposed to help you be a better you. But just like these maps aren't necessary anymore because of the apps on our phone, the self-help books aren't necessary either. Because you see, we have a source in God and God's Word that is even better than any self-help book could ever be. God's Word is a better source because He loves us. He knows where we are all the time. There's no getting lost with God. And if He knows where we are, then He knows when we're not on track. And He knows what it will take to get us back on track. And if we'll spend time talking to Him and in His Word, we'll figure out, based on His Word, how to get back on the track and on the plan that He wants us to be. You know, one day, our phone, or at least the map app on our phone, may be as obsolete as the road maps are now and as unnecessary as the self-help books are. But the really nice thing about God's Word is, the really cool thing is, it never changes. It will never become obsolete and neither will God's love. So if we want to find His plan for our life, we need to spend time in His Word and then all the, that's left to have or all that's left that we need is a willing heart to follow God's lead in finding His plan and following it through. Boys and girls, I hope you have a great week this week and until next time, God bless. Well, wasn't that good? I tell you, that uh, children's lesson reminds me exactly of this song we're about to sing. Uh, I think about all of the faults and failures that I have constantly on a day-to-day -day basis, and I know I'm sure you do too because we're human. But as many as we have, God has more mercy to give us. So let's rise and worship in this morning with His mercy is more.
take everything to God in prayer. That was excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. If you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 2. I think the kids are going to go to Children's Church also. Exodus chapter 2. While the kids are going out, let me remind everyone about the Annie Armstrong offering. Southern Baptists take two major offerings every year. Uh, One is called the Annie Armstrong offering, and that is around Easter time. And the Lottie Moon offering is around Christmas time. And the difference between the two offerings are pretty straightforward. The Lottie Moon offering that we do at Christmas is the offering that we do for international missions. And that supports nearly 5,000 missionaries all around the world. The Annie Armstrong offering is for North American missions. And that basically is in two major ways. One, we have, we, uh, the, the, the Annie Armstrong does uh, church planting. And I can say as a seminary prof that, that teaches, uh, I, can, I can actually uh, go through my mind, and I think there are hundreds of young men that I, can, that I have taught and I can think of who are now planting churches throughout North America. And in one of the most exciting things that's going on in Southern Baptist life is how many new churches are being planted and successfully planted in places that you don't really think about being Southern Baptist strongholds. Uh, there, are, there are some great churches in places like Washington, D.C., and in Baltimore, and in Seattle, and Boston. Uh, it is amazing what God is doing through the Annie Armstrong offering. And the second thing the Annie Armstrong offering does is it does uh, disaster relief. And let me just say, as somebody whose f- house flooded during Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, Penny and I's, our home was underwater for six weeks, uh, and uh, it meant the world to us to have dozens and dozens and even hundreds of Southern Baptists show up literally at our door to help us during that time. And the way that that was funded was through the Annie Armstrong offering. Our goal is $2,000. We can reach that goal. So please pray and ask God what we would have for you and your family to give and give generously to the Annie Armstrong offering. I think God will bless you. Well, Exodus chapter 2, we have been going through... um, Uh, the life, uh, the book of Exodus, and we've seen how God has been working through the lives of the midwives, and then we had the birth of Moses last week, and now this week, um, the golden boy has grown up, and the story is going to take a very strange turn. And so if you're able, please stand, and we're going to read, I'm going to read from Exodus chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. Exodus 2, verse 11. One day... When Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens and saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And they said to the man in the wrong, why, he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? And he answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs of, to water their father's flocks. The shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father Ruel, he said, How is it that you've come home so soon today? They said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, Well, then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son. And he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Or as some translators have it, I am a stranger in a strange land. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. As I said, the story goes in a direction we would not 
have expected if you'd never heard the story before. And in the minds of most, murder is the worst crime one can commit. Go ahead and bring up the next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> and as I said, it, in the mind of most, murder is the worst crime that one can commit. But what we're going to see from this chapter is that God uh, overcomes and He redeems our sins and our mistakes. And we're going to see that so very powerfully in this passage. The first thing that Moses is going to show us, and this is a lesson that I think every one of us has learned one way or another in a very sometimes bitter way, is that you can do the right thing in the wrong way. Have you ever done that? You ever went about something, well, well I meant well, yeah, but the way you did it wasn't right at all. And that's what's going to happen here. First, Moses is going to do a couple of good things. The first thing that he does right is that he identifies with the people of God. Look at verse 11. And it says, Then one day, when Moses had grown up... Now, ha, when Moses had grown up, what you're going to see, that's 40 years have gone by. In that one little expression there. Uh, you know, just the verse 2 before, he was, an, uh, he was a child, an infant. Now he's grown up, he's 40 years old. So just need to understand that one little phrase, zip, 40 years goes by. So now, it says, he went out to his people. Notice that. He sees them as his people, and he looked on their burdens, saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. Twice the, chapter, the verse refers to the Hebrews as one of his people. And folks, there comes a point, there comes a time when everyone has to choose whether he shall be identified with the people of God and with Christ or not. There comes a time when every one of us who've been saved by the grace of God has to say like Paul in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. There comes a time when you say, I'm not ashamed to be called a Christian. I'm not ashamed to be identified. Are you saved? Do you know that Jesus has washed you in His blood? Then you need to say so. You need to demonstrate that. That's what baptism does, is that it announces and identifies us with the people of God. And that's what, Pharaoh, what Moses does. He has been raised in Pharaoh's household. He's had it good for 40 years. And there comes a point and a time when Moses has to decide Am I going to be an Egyptian? Or am I going to be and identify myself with the people of God? I love how the author of Hebrews says it in Hebrews chapter 11. And I also love how the old King James says it. So let me bring up the verse there. Look at how the old King James, how it's just so alliterate, alliterated and so, so just poetical. It says, By faith Moses, when he had come to years refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. What a magnificent way to say it. What is he doing? He's identifying with the people of God. So the first thing he does right is that he identifies with the people of God. The second thing he does right is that he doesn't turn a blind eye to injustice. And notice how it says it again in verse 11, how it uses visual cues. It says he looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. Literally, the idea there is he saw with emotion. Now, what's going on here? You have to understand the Egyptians despised manual labor. Anybody who worked with their hands, they considered them to be of the lower class. And so the Hebrews are being forced to do the menial task, and the Egyptians now are looking upon the Hebrews as just mere chattel as slaves. And so they don't think a thing about treating them in a way that you and I would never treat a dog. We have here where it says that he is, the Egyptian was beating uh, the 
Hebrew. And so, Moses sees this. And it moves him. And let's remember the old saying, all it takes for evil to succeed is for good people to do nothing. And so he sees what's going on. He identifies with the people of God. Unfortunately, he still walks like an Egyptian. Notice what's happening. Now, in this verse, it says, verse 12, how's he going to handle it? He sees something. He said, I'm going to have to do something about this. Well, what's he going to do? Well, he looks this way and that, seeing no one. He strikes down the Egyptian and hides him in the sand. Now, there are some who try to justify what he's doing here. Uh, Some point out that, well, what he was doing, it was self-defense. Because the Egyptian, the word here for him, you know, hitting the the Hebrew, is is, it could be translated killing. So, you know, he says it looks like that the Hebrew was almost being beaten to death by the Egyptian. And so all he's doing here was self-defense. Okay, that may be that. Or you have someone like John Calvin who'll say, well, you know, Moses was royalty. And royalty had the legal right to use lethal force if the, the occasion called for it. And so I've, I've heard people try to, to justify this as that, well, it isn't really as bad as it sounds. Baloney. All you have to do is take a look at how it says it. The text makes it very clear that Moses knows he's doing something wrong. Look again at verse 12. What does he do? It says in verse 12, let me find it myself, he looked this way and that. Now, when you're looking both ways to make sure nobody sees what you're getting ready to do, what does that mean? You're doing something wrong. You're doing something bad. He knows he's wrong and he doesn't want to get caught. But now, folks, who doesn't sympathize with this situation here? I don't know if you've ever read the book by Corey Ten Boom, The Hiding Place. There's a wonderful movie uh, that that has also been made that tells her story, how her family, they were um, Christians in Holland during World War II, and they were hiding Jews in their home from the Nazis, and they were caught. And so Corey and her sister Betsy are then sent to a concentration camp. And they go, go, the book then tells the harbors and the ordeal that those two sisters uh, underwent in the concentration camp. And, and Corey is, lives to tell the, sta- to, uh, the tale. Betsy does not. Betsy dies in the concentration camp. But Corey tells about the time that a guard was beating Betsy. And after it was over and Betsy was recovering there in their barracks, Corey told Betsy how much she hated the guard and hated him so badly she said, I saw an axe nearby and I wanted to pick up the axe and I wanted to chop that guard into pieces. And Betsy said to her sister Corey, no, Corey, no hate. Never, never hate. And that is the lesson that's being taught here, is that you don't want... Now, Moses wants to deliver the Hebrews, but he's thinking and he's acting like an Egyptian. And so what happens is, here is the one who's on the verge of greatness, but he throws it all away. Because the next verse tells about how... The next day he goes, and this time it's not an Egyptian and a Hebrew. It's two Hebrews fighting. Now, <clears throat> look at verse 13. It says, it says, He went out the next day. Behold, the two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? Now, here's one of the takeaway points that I want you to get today. I'll actually have a couple of them, but I really want you to get this one. Because this is an important point. And that is, this verse lets you see the difference between a liberal and a conservative. You say, how does this verse show me the difference between a liberal and a conservative? Well, a liberal sees a collective social injustice, structural injustice. And it's very clear what the Egyptians are doing to the Hebrews is a corporate, systemic cultural injustice but it's external and if Moses was thinking all we need to do is 
fix this external problem and it's solved. No, that's the way liberals approach it. Conservatives always deal with the personal, the individual. We just need to solve the individual. If we can just fix what's wrong with the individual person, then that's dealing with the problem. No, what you notice here, folks, it even goes more... You, Moses delivers, and here, I'm going to go ahead and tell you the head of the story. They actually get to leave Egypt. I guess you already know that. But for the remainder of the book of Exodus, they don't have the Egyptians to deal with. You say, boy, I bet their problems are solved. I bet they all get along now. I bet it's all peaches and cream, sunshine and light. No. Because what they found is, is that as bad as the external problems are, there are internal problems also. It's not enough to simply solve the social structure. You also have to deal with the individual and the, in, in, in the situation of the heart. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn, the Russian commentator, said, who spent many years in a Russian gulag, he said, the problem with the human condition is that good, the line between good and evil runs down the middle of each human heart. The problem is on the inside also. And so that's what we see here, where now it's not a problem with the Egyptians, it's a problem on the inside. And then he finds out that the secret that he thought was a secret, it, 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 it's not so much of a secret. Because they said, well, are you going to kill us like you killed, killed me, like you killed the guy yesterday? And then it says Moses was afraid and thought the thing is surely known. And in fact, when Moses heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. Uh, and so, he, he's, what is he going to do now? He's burned his bridges. He, he's in trouble with the Egyptians. But guess what? The Hebrews don't want him. In fact, in the book of Acts, the way Stephen puts it, he said they pushed Moses aside. And so now, if you'll notice, it describes Moses as being afraid and as fleeing. His actions were unappreciated. Now a death warrant has been signed. He is running from his life. He goes all the way to Midian. He arrives exhausted, scared, and tired. And we see in verse 15, there, at the end of verse 15, he collapses beside a well, exhausted. And he sat down by a well. So, <clears throat> here we have someone trying to do the right thing in the wrong way. And if we can learn that lesson, we'll be will be miles ahead. In fact, that is point number two. Learning from his mistakes. Because what happens next? Well, the seven daughters of the, of the priest of Midian arrives, and they are trying to draw water. But as they are, the shepherds there are, are about to chase them off. And notice what he does. Moses defends, but he does not kill. Because in verse 16 it says, The priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water from the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stands up and he saves them. Now, Moses is acting like he's supposed to be. A deliverer. So he's defending, but not killing. And then it isn't just that. If you'll notice, it says that after he saved them, look at the last part of verse 17. And he watered their flock. Now, <clears throat> when they go home, dad says, well, how did you get home so quickly? And they said, well, you're not going to believe this, but uh, there was an Egyptian there and he chased off the shepherds. And then after he chased off the shepherds, notice what the ladies say about him in verse 18 and 19. And he drew water for us and watered the flock. And this brings up the second thing. Not only does Moses now defend but does not kill, Moses serves in the most menial way. Now, you, again, it's hard for you and me. One of the things I like about being in America is that working with your hands is not looked down upon. If you're somebody who, who's a hardworking person, nobody, nobody thinks you're, you're bad or looks down on you. In fact, that's, that's a sign of respect. It's kind of hard for us to get our heads around this in that the Egyptian culture and in the Middle Eastern culture, the two things, number one, if you worked with your hands, it meant you were a slave. It meant you were of a lower class. And the only other persons who worked 
beside, with their hands besides slaves were women. And the, the two lowest on the caste system in this time are slaves and women. And the one thing a man did not do was women's work. And here was this Egyptian. Not only does he help those women, then he does their job for them. He draws the water and he waters the flock. And this is mind-blowing to them. Fellas, there's a lesson here. Uh, in, in the morning service, after I got done, we got to talk, and they said, yeah, you quit preaching at that point, and you started meddling. Because uh, <clears throat> I started talking about, you know, there are things around the house that have been traditionally associated with women through the years that, you know what, fellas, this passage, if it teaches anything, it is teaching that we are not to think we're too good to do anything. That actually what we have here is that not only has he learned to defend without killing, but he's also serving. And he serves in the most menial way. Sounds like Moses the prince has learned some lessons. And notice, the dad says, well, bring him home. And so they do. And now notice how Moses finds contentment. And so it says... Verse 21, And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. And so we have where he finds contentment. Uh, and not only does he find contentment, he even finds a wife. Uh, even if she does have a funny name. And so as he finds contentment, Moses learns an important lesson. Look at verse 22. And she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I am a stranger in a strange land. And so Moses teaches a lesson that Ken Keithley needs today, and maybe you need it too. And that is to be content, but recognize I'm not home yet. Notice how he describes himself. I am a stranger in a strange land. Now, I want you to know, I don't feel like a stranger in the United States of America. I don't feel like a stranger in North Carolina. I feel, you know, I, I grew up in the United States. I, I am glad to be an American. Um, and I'll have to tell you something, folks. I like life. I like living here. It's all good. But, I mean, I suspect you'd say the same thing, too. But is Moses home? Notice what he says there. He says, <clears throat> and Moses was content, but he's not home. That's what you and I are to, to feel and how you and I are to look at our present state. We are to be content, but we're not home yet. We're not home yet. He says, and, and now think about it. Where is home for Moses? It's not Egypt. Egypt is not his home. And so it is for you and me. I am a saved man living in the United States. I am an American citizen who is a Christian. And as a Christian, washed in the blood of Jesus, living in the 21st century, I'm going to tell you, Life's pretty good. Life's pretty good. Could be. I mean, I can think of a lot of things that could be worse. So I have great things to be content about. And at the same time, I am not to look upon myself, and you are not to look upon yourself as being at home. Rather, notice what Peter says in 1 Peter. Notice how he refers back to this verse as he describes what New Testament Christians are going to be like. He said, Beloved, I beg you as what? Strangers and pilgrims. Abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. You and I were to be content, but we're to recognize we are strangers and pilgrims. And so Moses may have done, tried to do the right thing in the wrong way, but he has learned from his mistakes. 
Now, this brings up the third point, and I like this a lot, and that is that all of this has been going on all in God's good time. And so look at verse 23. Have you ever been reading a story or listening to a movie and they'll say, meanwhile, back at the ranch? Well, that's what happens here. Meanwhile, what's going on? Verse 23. It says, during those many days, the king of Egypt died. Now, <clears throat> it says a lot right there. When it says, during those many days, that's another 40 years. Zip! Verse 11, 40 years. Verse 23, 40 years. 80 years go by. Uh, and here's the thing, folks. <clears throat> Up to this point in the book of Exodus that I've preached to you now these last couple of weeks, all we've had is God's providence. We've had the, the midwives. We've had uh, Moses' mother and Pharaoh's uh, daughter. And we now had Pharaoh, our, our, our Moses, and Moses being raised up and all that sort of thing going on. God has been in the background. God has not been at the front. Here is where God now moves to center stage. Now God is going to act. And as He does act, we see what goes on. First, we see that the Pharaoh dies. Now, it took 40 years. I have a complaint with God. It's a complaint that most Christians have with God. It's the complaint the psalmist. You can find this complaint over and over again in the Old Testament where the psalmist will say, God, you move too slow. Have you seen that? I mean... <clears throat> There are times where I think God could do things quicker. I mean, 80 years have gone by, and it doesn't seem to bother God that 80 years has gone by. Well, folks, has it ever occurred to you and me that God may be operating on a different time scale than we are, and that He's really not concerned about getting all that He wants done, done in your lifetime or my lifetime? The fact is, God moves slower than we want Him to. But He's doing more than we'll ever know or can even imagine. And so we see where the Pharaoh dies and the people, God's people, pray. Look again at verse 23. Twice in the text, it says that they prayed. It says that they cried out in verse 23. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery. And they cried out for help. Their cry for uh, rescue from slavery came up to God. In fact, that word cry could be translated screamed. Because it is them crying out, shrieking in agony. And so they're screaming. Now, <clears throat> I don't like suffering. I think anybody that likes suffering, they're mental cases and they need help. I mean, you got to be sick in the head to think that suffering is somehow something that you're going to enjoy or that you'd want. I don't like to suffer. Do you? I don't want to suffer. It bothers me. It bothers me when I see somebody I care about suffering. It just crawls all over me. So I don't like suffering. I, I can think of all kinds of things, whether it's physical suffering or, or the circumstances of life. I wish I didn't have to use a cane. I, 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 don't, I don't like that. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't point to anything that's bad or suffering that I think that, oh boy, that's great. On the other hand, would the children of Israel ever been willing to leave Egypt if they had not been suffering? What if it was all good for them? And they said, you know, got a great home, got a good business, got this beautiful garden. It's good here in the land of Goshen. And now you want us to leave? No. Why is it that God in His providence has allowed them to suffer so terribly? It is so that they would understand that they are not at home in Egypt. I believe that suffering may be a bit like C.S. Lewis said it was. That suffering is God's megaphone. That He can get our attention when we're so distracted by the day-to-day -day things of life. And so we have 
where the people are praying. And they're praying because they're suffering. And then notice how God keeps His promises. In verse 24, it says it in such interesting ways. Because it says, And God heard their groaning, and God remembered His covenant. Now, every time you see where it says, and God heard, or God saw, or God remembered, these are what's known as anthropomorphic expressions, where it describes something about God in human ways. And so when it says that God remembered His covenant, He's not remembering in the same way you and I would remember. You know, (laughs) excuse me, Uh, it isn't like you'd say, "Uh uh-oh, I remember I left something on the stove. It's not that God forgot about something and went back to it. That's not what it means. What does it mean when it says, and God remembered His covenant? It means that God is going to act. And notice all of the action verbs that it has here. So, and what I love about this, what does God remember about the children of Israel? Does He remember their sins? No. Does He remember their failures? No. What does God remember? He remembers the covenant He made with them. And so it is with you and me. God remembers us in a gracious way. And so God keeps His promises. And they'll notice in verse 25 how God is in control. Because, and like I said, notice the action verbs. Four of them. God heard. God remembered, God saw, and the verse ends in such a remarkable way. And God knew. What is it letting us know? That all this time, God has been perfectly attentive. And that He has been totally in control. And so He is today. What does this text teach us? What does this account tell us? And that is that God, when He steps in, God overcomes and redeems all of our failures. Father in heaven, oh, thank you for this story. Lord, if if we didn't have this story about Moses, and then he delivered, and you used him to deliver the people of of Israel from Egypt, we'd say, well, of course, look, look what a great man he was. But you show us this to let us know that the greatness belongs to you. It's a great grace. It's a great patience. It's a great love because you are a great God. God, in the end, you are the only hero that we see. And so, Lord, I pray, Father, for each and every one of us here, if there's someone here that has never experienced the kind of forgiveness that Moses experienced and that we who are Christians have experienced, then, Lord, I pray for them today would be a day of great grace, that they would bow the knee to Jesus Christ and receive Him as Lord and Savior. And for those of us, dear Lord, who are on the journey but have become discouraged because we have disappointed ourselves and we feel that we've disappointed you, then teach us, dear Father, that you redeem our mistakes. You overcome our failures. And that not only do you work despite us, oh, thank you, Lord, for working through us. We thank you, Father, for all this in Jesus' name. And amen. Let's all stand. And as we stand, the worship team is going to lead us. And as they lead us, my dear friend, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would love to be able to show you in Scripture how He can save you from your sins. And if it is that you just need to come and pray and do business with God, then the altar is open. Why don't you come as we sing? Worship team, lead us.
mountain. 